Each year, more than a million people flock to the town of Mecca in Saudi Arabia to fulfill the dream of a lifetime. They're Muslims, and they're on their way to pay homage to Muhammad, the seventh century prophet whose teachings are the bedrock of Islam. There are 450 million Muslims in the world, one in every seven people, and they all regard Mecca as their spiritual home. And at the core of it, the Kaaba, a black marble building sanctified by Muhammad as the most sacred shrine of the faith. Five times a day, Muslims throughout the world kneel in prayer in the direction of Mecca exactly as ordained more than a thousand years ago. But if that hasn't changed, a great deal else has. No other creed has ever been so rapidly overtaken by new realities. This week, Echo looks at the changing world of Islam. Muslim faith, enshrined in the Quran, the book of Muhammad's teachings, upholds the worship of an invisible God, of whom Muhammad was the earthly prophet. Uniquely among the major religions, it admits of no images, and there are no statues or carvings in a Muslim mosque. Islam means, literally, submission to the will of God through obedience to the Quran. But this total acceptance is a two-sided coin. It accounts for the strength of the religion and the perpetuation of its way of life. It also accounts for a degree of indifference, a reluctance to alter ancient custom, and an obsession for the past, which characterizes so much of the Muslim world. And the nearer the center of the faith, the slower has been the recognition that the rest of the world is a changed place. The Middle East, so near to Europe, and yet so far from European standards of life, has taken an astonishingly long time to rouse itself from that indifference which cramped it for centuries. Overlooked, brushed aside, the Arab peoples contented themselves with an acceptance of their fate, content, as always, to submit to the will of their God. And yet it's worth remembering that the ancestors of the Arabs spread the creed of Islam to the very limits of the world they knew in a dynamic explosion of armed and cultural conquest in the second half of the first millennium. From the Mediterranean to the mid-Pacific, from southern Europe to the middle of Africa, Islam is a faith, a creed, a vital force in the lives of millions. But the world they once influenced so greatly outstripped them. The energy with which they had once become great ebbed away, and a people who were once outward looking became introspective and withdrawn, finding comfort in the only thing which remained constant, their faith. And the unity they once knew was replaced by tribal bitterness and warfare. For centuries, they turned their swords on each other. What they lacked was a common purpose, an outlet, a reason to unite. They waited for it for hundreds of years and found it only a generation ago, Israel. 
two wars with Israel have unified the Arabs as never before. Traditional bickering still divides them, but the will to unite has been kept alive by a new kind of leader. Gaddafi of Libya, Naimiri of Sudan, and Gamal Abdul Nasser are three who have fed the fires of Arab Union, seeing it as the only hope against Israeli superiority. The most charismatic of the new Arab leaders, Nasser, led Egypt into far-reaching alliances with the Soviet Union to mount his anti-Israeli crusade. Since then, Russia has poured vast numbers of military advisors and quantities of military equipment into Arab hands and supervised the training of Arab troops to use them, well knowing that the communist cause is best served by prolonging the crisis. The Arabs seem to be intent on rushing headlong into a third war with Israel. Nasser is dead and the banner of Islamic and Arab unity is not firmly in the hands of a successor. But whoever finally seizes it may find that his most lasting legacy is a binding alliance between Islamic Arab states and a nation which represses its own Islamic peoples as a matter of official policy. There may not be much to cheer about. But this is. Fate has played a grim joke on much of the Muslim world. Islam existed as a way of life in most of the poorest corners of the earth, leaving millions of Muslims to scratch a living out of desert and swamp. It needed other people to unveil the riches beneath their feet. Now they find they have 66% of the world's petroleum, 70% of natural rubber, one third of the phosphates, half the world's tin, 40% of jute, half the copra fiber. All this in Muslim hands. And so a two-way flow gushes in and out of the Muslim world. Raw materials out, dollars, pounds, francs, marks, and the know-how of the West in, and on a massive scale. The influx of money and industrial experience is generating major changes, particularly in the Middle East and North Africa. The age-old problems of poverty, ignorance and isolation are beginning to yield. And so is the formerly inflexible lifestyle which for centuries typified the Muslim world. Now it's on the move, lubricated by oil and the money the West pays for it. The sons of nomad Bedouin sheikhs are digging the foundations of new houses, new schools, new hospitals, and a new life. But what has most astonished foreign observers is that the sudden arrival of the 20th century has failed to alter the Muslim faith in Islam. The religion of Muhammad, it seems, is going to be as relevant in the industrial age as it was in the age of the camel. The Arabs are reaching high in trying to correct what they see as a slow start in the modern world. Today their city streets are pungent with the same exhaust fumes that pollute the proudest western capital. But so far, no one seems to care. And yet, alongside the throb of car engines, the sound of the Russian language can be heard more and more frequently in these streets as more and more military advisers arrive to train the massive armies being built here. One wonders how Islam will fare under their influence. If the Arabs are currently in the driving seat, where will they lead the rest of Islam's 450 millions? Will it be that increased Soviet presence guides them away from their faith? Or is it that Islam is repeating its history, absorbing other cultures and turning them to its own advantage? The opportunity is there for today's modern Islamic countries to unite, 
to force the world to look in their direction to mecca and beyond